All right, welcome everyone to the two o'clock Tech Talk. Our speaker today is gonna to be Cole Pazar from the Colorado School of Mines. He's gonna be talking to you about resource utilization on Mars. Cole, the floor is yours. All right, everybody. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, it's my pleasure to this presentation on resource utilization on Mars. I've kind of catered it overall to a general audience, but I do go into depth uh, about a lot of the technical aspects. I have a bunch of slides to cover today. Um, I'll try to get through it quickly so I can answer everyone's questions. So the learning goals for today, I want you guys to learn what resources are available to enable sustainable presence on Mars and how will humans use these resources. So a little bit about myself, I graduated in 2016 from the University of Colorado Boulder, my bachelor's in geological sciences. I got a minor in astrophysical planetary science. That's where I focused on mainly planetary geology. Uh, this year, I was accepted in the Colorado School of Mines uh, Center for Space Resources, so I'm currently doing my master's there. Uh, I'm also a rock climber and an artist. I Photoshop these images. They're real images, but they're composite photos. Uh, I just like making art of various kinds, as you might know. Um, first, we're going to talk about where are these resources. So on Mars, there's the atmosphere, there's a surface, and there's a subsurface. Those are the three areas where we can get resources from. The other area that's not presented on this slide is we, uh, materials or manufactured things brought from Earth. Uh, but why do we need these resources? It's for scientific exploration purposes, uh, for sustainable infrastructure, and for permanent colonization, uh, ultimately leading to stuff like city development. Uh, this is an image some of you guys may be familiar with from SpaceX, uh, the idea of an early Mars base. Uh, so in this presentation, I'm going to give you guys a current knowledge overview, as well as the gun known governing chemical processes and current systems and technologies that are in development and uh, processes and systems basically co combined are what we consider technologies. So there's nine key resource requirements to sustain uh, technological life on another planet or the moon. Uh, that's air, water, power food, fuel, or propellant, uh, plastics, metals, glass, and shelter. Uh, so resources in general could be material resources or they could be non-material resources, such as lava tubes. So they're also considered a resource. Um, what is ISRU? It's a term you guys may have heard a lot in the past couple of days if you've uh, been listening to any of these other talks, but it's an abbreviation for in situ resource utilization. Sometimes people call it in space resource utilization. But what this means is living off the land, using the resources that are there to enable sustainable presence. Uh, so the definition of ISRU, basically collection, processing, storing, and use of space resources that re to replace materials that would otherwise be brought from Earth. This really increases the, the sustainability, allows you to live completely without any um, materials brought from Earth, and this drastically reduces the cost and overall risk of emission. There are some stages in ISRU that includes prospecting, acquisition, processing, production, and utilization, ultimately. Um, each one of these stages has a bunch of sub-stages, as you can see here. Uh, we're basically going to go over uh, all this stuff in, in the rest of my slides. Uh, but it covers everything from excavation, mining, extraction, separating materials, um, storing mat materials, handling them, transporting them. Uh, and then in terms of utilization, that's gonna be stuff for like construction, manufacturing, and then sale of, uh, of materials, and also recycling, because we wanna close the loop. Uh, so what resources will be acquired first? Well, this depends on the extractability, which is the difficulty of getting those resources, the economics, uh, how if it's gonna make any economic sense or if it's economically feasible, and the power requirements. So from this uh, sequence slide here that I, that I made, basically volatiles are the thing that's first sought after. That includes water ice, hydroxides to turn into water ice, carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere, Mars, uh, and trace volatiles. Then you go after the bulk regolith and soils uh, in the bulk regolith that does sometimes include water ice, um, silicates, phyllosilicates, aluminosilicates. Those are just other minerals and clay minerals um, that are really useful for construction as well as for processing the water that's locked up in their mineral structure. Uh, and then eventually metals. Uh, metals take the most energy uh, for extraction and processing, therefore they're 
considered a difficulty, a high difficulty of extractability. Uh, it's, before infrastructure is in place, it would cost a lot of money to extract metals. Uh, before we talk about all the different resources, we're gonna first premise this with power because power is needed first for all the subsequent activities and technologies. Without it, we would perish. Um, so we can talk about first solar power. So solar power on Mars, it get re Mars receives 590 watts per meter squared at the top of the atmosphere um, compared to Earth, which is 1360. So if you brought a standard 325 watt residential solar panel to Mars, that would be around 140 watts. So it's not the same amount of available sunlight. Um, ultimately on Mars, it'd be a combination between solar and nuclear power. These are the two most obvious and easy um, sources for power generation on Mars. Uh, some examples of nuclear power reactors are the kilopower fission reactors uh, currently being worked on by NASA. Um, liquid fluoride thorium reactors, which uses molten salt, uh, has been proposed in the past, and RTGs, uh, which basically is a thermal thermoelectric generator that is what, for example, the Curiosity rover uh, currently uses. Uh, for a really large amount of humans, like greater than 3,000 people, nuclear is what makes a lot more sense uh, in terms of the scale because you need an extremely massive solar array uh, to support uh, that kind of infrastructure. It's also really difficult to install such a massive solar array if you've done any solar installs uh, yourself. Um, it's also really unclear whether or not certain radioactive elements will be easy to locate and extract for use in nuclear reactors on Mars. We do know that they do exist, particularly thorium. Um, and since nuclear materials, <coughs> radioactive elements do exist on Earth, we do expect them to also exist on Mars, but it's unclear uh, where they would be necessarily. It's also really difficult to manufacture in situ uh, nuclear generators, like creating uh, nuclear generators on Mars. So the majority of those would have to be transported from Earth. Um, geothermal power isn't really great on Mars uh, because our, our very few heat, heat flow measurements from the Martian surface shows that it's pretty low. It's also got a very thick crust. Uh, so that makes it extremely difficult for that. And wind power also isn't great on Mars um, because it would take a wind speed of around 30 meters per second um, to produce normal uh, electricity generation with the best kind of wind power technology. But surface wind speeds on Mars are only 26 meters per second maximum. And the main reason why it's so difficult for wind power on Mars is the atmospheric pressure is very low. Um, other potential future options that I'm not gonna talk about are like space-based solar power or concentrated solar power. So space-based solar power is where they beam solar energy from orbit down to the planet and concentrated solar power uses like mirrors to concentrate that, that energy. Uh, but this slide talks about photovoltaic solar power technologies. Uh, right now, the best solar panels are around 25% efficiency. So that's around 125 watts per meter squared for Mars. Um, this paper just came out earlier this month uh, showing that we have new technologies that are increasing the efficiency of solar cells. This is a tandem cell using both gallium arsenide and silicon. Uh, with a triple junction uh, in order to increase that efficiency. Basically, this, this, the figure on the right shows that it's covering a broader spectrum of the energy that's received. Uh, the largest solar farms on Earth are around two gigawatts uh, in certain areas of India. There's actually like two of them. Uh, for Mars, this would take around 16 square kilometers of array size and not including like the spacing between the arrays and stuff like that. So. Ultimately, if you wanted to extract one megaton of water, just considering the extraction energy alone, that requires about one kilometer squared of area uh, over, like, if you wanted to extract that amount of water over one year. That's also equivalent to around 200 Starship launches. So this shows that you really will need a combination of solar and nuclear power. Um, on Mars also, the solar years are around 687 days and with an axial tilt of 25 degrees, similar to Earth, the year is about two times as long. Uh, so this requires sufficient energy storage uh, because of the longer Martian night and or the longer Martian winter and also slightly um, longer day. Basically, we need a way to store all this energy. So for this will be done primarily through lithium ion battery banks, uh, really large scale battery banks. It's also unclear how much lithium would be available on Mars for manufacturing these things. So initially, a lot of this stuff would have to be brought um, from Earth. 
And Tesla's aiming for around 500 watt hours per kilogram. This is going to this is going to improve that that launch cost for the, those uh, batteries. Uh, but to give you guys an example of large scale uh, lithium ion battery storage, uh, this is the image, uh, artificial image of the Tesla Mega Packs in Australia. Um, this is a storage capacity of around three megawatt hours uh, and an inverter capacity of uh, one and a half megawatts of alternating current. So there is a decent amount of atmosphere on Mars that we can use. Um, it is less than 1% of the atmosphere that we have here on Earth, but it is 95% carbon dioxide and 2.7% nitrogen. Uh, so we're gonna need to concentrate this atmosphere, uh, the nitrogen itself, if you want to have the inner component of breathable air. Humans have need around 78% of nitrogen in the atmosphere and 22% uh, oxygen. So there's a lot of other ways we can produce our own oxygen. I'll get into that. Um, but ultimately the available CO2 for Mars for use in acquiring that oxygen and propellant is 25 million metric tons. And the low nitrogen content, like I said, is an issue, um, but with enough power, you, you can, you can concentrate 17 pascals, which is what, how much nitrogen roughly there is on average across Mars you'd have to concentrate that by 4,600 4, times that amount. And so con concentrating that with compressors um, is gonna take a lot of energy, but it's feasible. Uh, initially, nitrogen would have to be brought from Earth and then you'd just be recycling that in the life support system. So you wouldn't have to keep continually replenish it as well. Um, so there is a lot of research that's been done on water on Mars. It turns out there is a substantial amount of water ice. It's around uh, Elon Musk, uh, said in his 2017 paper, there's around 5 million cubic kilometers of water ice, which is enough, which is way more than enough for human needs if we were to, if we were able to access and use all of that. Um, but some examples of where water exists on Mars are in surface ice uh, in the polar glaciers. So around 70 degrees north, there's a really cool location called Korolev Crater, which has got, it's about 80 kilometers wide, so really pretty massive. Um, there's around 300, three, like 2,000 to 3,000 cubic kilometers of water ice uh, in that crater. Um, so basically you just have to melt it and then you'd, you'd have the water. So the extraction process is relatively simple. Um, there's a lot of hydrated minerals on the surface of Mars. So this map shows all the mineral detections on Mars. The blue and the pink dots are the areas of interest, uh, the minerals of interest for water. Um, those are like basically your clay minerals um, and hydrated sulfates uh, like uh, gypsum. This has around five to fifteen percent weight percent water. Um, also, high interest is icy regolith. So there's water in the soil uh, of Mars, and this can range between one to ten percent, or possibly even really high, very high concentrations um, of water ice. This is an image from the Phoenix lander. Uh, that shows literally ice just below the surface from where the dust, uh, the overlying regolith got blown away when the lander uh, was making its entry, descent, and landing. There are also a lot of hypersaline subglacial, not a lot, but there has been recently detection of uh, liquid, hypersaline liquid lakes underneath the south pole of Mars. Uh, it's around a one mile deep and this is potentially a resource that could be extracted, but in the polar regions of Mars, there is an extremely harsh environment, not that conductive to humans. So we do primarily focus on things such as the subsurface uh, glacial ice, like in low-bait low -bait debris aprons, and ice in the regolith. Uh, so this map is a, is a ice consistency map uh, that's compiled from an integrated from five different data sets. Uh, by Ben Putzig and, the, and his team, this, they call themselves the swim team. Um, they use primarily their, their team works on the shallow radar, uh, but this map is for, integrated from multiple different data sets. Uh, you see the white points here in the regions of like Arcadia Planitia and Flegger Montes. They are actual detections of water ice exposed at the surface from impacts. Uh, and the, the blue on this map shows that is a high probability of a substantial amount of accessible water, water ice. Um, so for extracting this water ice and basically any kind of volatile uh, extraction, it requires energy to produce a phase change or chemical reaction. 
So one of the main ways you'd get liquid water from, from depth is rod well type drilling. Um, basically you just send a, you'd make, you make a drill hole, you send a probe down and you start heating the ice down below and it opens up a pocket uh, with water and you can pump that water out. Um, there's a lot of specifics that goes into this kind of extraction. Um, but Honeybee Robotics has been working on this uh, a lot. Um, and another, another method that Honeybee Robotics has uh, implemented for like rovers and for smaller scale stuff is the planetary volatiles extractor. It uses an insulating auger that drills into the subsurface to uh, basically create a core sample and pull the material out. Um, but in terms of the rod well type drilling method, uh, Chris Acne and the team at Honeybee Robotics has been working on uh, what they call the Redwater Project, where they use the coiled tubing method uh, to get down to a deep depth and then use the rod well method where they use a, a, a heating element uh, deep below the surface to heat the water ice and extract the liquid, um, then store it uh, above surface. So the atmosphere, you'd have, in order to process the atmosphere, you have to create a fan blower using pumps uh, as well to bring the atmosphere in, concentrate it. Uh, first, you have to filter out all the dust and then you can compress it, uh, condense it and liquefy uh, each individual component. Uh, so this is from Marspedia, a website that Robert Zubrin uh, has created, uh, basically showing some of these components. You have a fan, goes through the dust filter uh, and then compresses it and then cools it. Uh, each time you cool that atmosphere, that's how it's gonna separate it out because each, each, each compound has a different um, point, like liquidation point. Uh, and so first thing that would con condense out is water, followed by CO2, and then you'd be left with nitrogen, argon, and oxygen, which those last three would be used for like your inner, inner component of breathable air. And the amount of oxygen is very, very minimal. Uh, so there's other ways we're gonna be able to produce that. Current atmospheric processing technology that's been in development is the Marco Polo uh, from NASA, at the Kennedy Space Center. They've been working on that. And so there are six governing chemical reactions uh, to produce water, oxygen, and propellant on Mars. So this is really important. So water electrolysis, Sabatier reaction, the reverse water gas shift, uh, which is originally uh, shown as a, as a viable means by Raul Rizubrin, uh, solid oxide electrolytic cells, uh, like the MOXIE mission that's currently getting sent to Mars, um, the Bodard reaction and the fischer tropsch reaction. Um, the next slide is gonna show the technologies for these first four. And then the slide after that, I'm gonna show an integrated um, example of all these processes. So electrolysis, relatively straightforward. It's a, system, it's a process that most people might know. This is the primary way that we would convert water into usable propellant and like LOX propellant and liquid hydrogen propellant. Uh, as well as oxygen for human consumption, uh, consumables. Uh, the reverse, this is an example. The second photo here is an example of the reverse water gas shift reactor uh, produced, that's currently in development uh, by NASA Kennedy Space Center. Um, this photo on the top shows a Sabatier reactor example. This component gets integrated into the rest of the system. Uh, and the bottom right shows what the solid oxide electrolysis cell process looks like for MOXIE. Um, that's the, currently the 1% scale model that's on its way to Mars. It uses a zirconia catalyst uh, in the cell. And it's, primarily, its primary purpose is to show that we can produce oxygen using energy to create or from CO2 in the Martian atmosphere. So putting all of these governing chemical processes together, uh, on the left, we see the available resources on Mars. So that's water in the surface and in the subsurface. And 96% atmosphere on Mars and 2% nitrogen. So that's what, we're, that's what we're working with. So then going to the right, we end up with usable end products. So that's liquid oxygen for propellant or oxygen for consumption, liquid methane, which is the primary fuel that's gonna be used on Mars, and hydrogen or, and water, which is very useful for everything from human consumption to radiation shielding to growing plants and everything. And then the syngas reaction, this produces plastics as well. Uh, so basically with electrolysis, you produce hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen from that, instead of producing it into liquid hydrogen for propellant, it would be used as an input to the Sabatier reaction or as an input to the reverse water gas shift reaction or as an input for producing plastics in the 
Fischer-Tropp reaction. So the syngas reaction is also known as a Fischer-Tropp reaction. Um, and then for solid oxide electrolysis, one of the one of the unuseful byproducts of that is you just get reacted graphite. Um, and so you can combine that graphite with CO2 uh, in the Bodard reaction to create carbon monoxide as well. So you at all the three carbon monoxide uh, reactants or products that you get from the reverse water gas shift, solid oxide electrolysis, those are then inputs to produce plastics uh, when you combine that with hydrogen. So ultimately, some of the requirements that humans need on Mars could be considered for four people. Um, for a 500, 600 day long mission is around 70 tons of water minimum. And using Korolev Crater as an example, the slide that I was showing earlier, that's enough water for around 1 million people for 20,000 years. So in areas where there's a substantial amount of easily accessible water ice, it doesn't seem like water is going to be the biggest issue. Uh, this fact, this brief calculation I made doesn't factor in anything like water recycling either. Um, so in terms of resource availability of regolith, it's literally all over the surface. Regolith is defined as like the bulk unconsolidated material at the surface. You can literally grab a shovel and be faster than some of the robots. Um, it's unknown how much rare earth elements are in regolith in different areas. So for, in terms of metals, a lot of those are gonna have to be delivered from Mars from asteroid mining and asteroid belt or on Phobos or Deimos. For example, Honeybee Robotics is sending a sample collection mission to Phobos in 2024. Um, primarily, regolith does consist of mostly uh, plagioclase feldspar. Um, alien sands are very useful all, and abundant all over the surface of Mars for producing glass directly. Uh, and we have a lot of, there's a potential for a, a lot of iron nickel meteorites on Mars because of the atmosphere and the low, low, low gravity uh, could have preserved a decent amount of this stuff. I'll get into how we process that. Um, but in terms of excavating regolith, Regolith is going to be required for agriculture, construction materials, and the water content if it's icy regolith. Uh, so right now, the best technology uh, for robotic technology for excavation is the Razor robot uh, produced by NASA uh, Kennedy Space Center Swamp Works, and the PI on that is Rob Mueller. Basically, the low gravity of Mars, slight, uh, it's like basically a third of the Earth. That limits the operation for most terrestrial type of excavation. Uh, but this uses a counter rotating bucket drum method that solves this problem. In terms of plagioclase, uh, you can, after you crush that down, uh, there's a lot of uh, processes you can use, hydrothermal treatments that you can use to produce use more usable materials uh, for agriculture, for rock, raw materials, for construction, things like that. Uh, this integrated diagram shows atmospheric processing module, water processing module, and the soil processing module together. Um, but basically, in this red box shows just the stuff for processing regolith. So once you have unconsolidated regolith, you need to put it into a hopper, then you can react it. Basically, that just means heating it up. Uh, and then that's how you get water out of it. And for most volatile processing, as you see in some of these, it also requires dryers, uh, liquefaction, and storage. Uh, for producing metals, typically requires a lot of energy, really high temperature reactions. So until large scale infrastructure is in place, a lot of metals will have to be brought from Earth uh, or potentially from asteroid mining. Um, also another way you can produce oxygen is through magnetite reduction of, uh, or reduction of magnetite with energy. Um, producing carbonyl alloys, uh, like useful things for producing steel uh, is an easy, is slightly easier method. Um, directly from iron nickel meteorites because you don't have to separate the iron from the oxygen as you, as you would in these other reactions. Um, and another thing that's been pr proposed is biological extraction of iron uh, from Martian regolith, so using biology to actually extract that. Um, in terms of construction and manufacturing from regolith, um, it's super important because you need material in order to produce um, structures. So the Photo on the bottom left that shows a 3D printing design from the AI Space Factory. They won the 2019 uh, 3D printing phase three challenge. Uh, and the one on the right shows the same a similar structure, but basically printed out of ice. Uh, so you need radiation shielding. Um, primarily a lot of areas, a lot of habitats will be built underground to solve this problem. 
and you could use lava tubes as a potential resource. Um, additive manufacturing, 3D printing stuff is very important for Mars. Uh, Everything is going to eventually have to be manufactured, like a full entire production chain. Um, the most difficult things to manufacture are going to be like computer chips, nuclear reactors, advanced components, or even self-replicating robots. Um, the, a lot of that stuff is going to have to be brought from Mars. Uh, to briefly talk about water, I mean, briefly talk about food requirements, uh, it's going to require water, clays, sulfates, phosphates in, from the soil. You're also going to have to remove toxins such as perchlorate uh, and got to have some sort of biological synergy in the soil. Uh, so a lot of plants have been shown to grow, plants have been shown to grow in certain Martian regular simulants, uh, but we have to be careful about that because they're just simulants, they're not actual Martian soil. Um, so it, there has to be some sort of synergy with life support systems. It's like bioweathering of cyanobacteria. So a project that's been working on this is the Melissa project uh, from the European Space Agency. And Ultimately, humans are going to have to adapt to the terrain and soil composition available to produce food from the from the given regolith. And they're going to mix it with crushed up bedrock for fresh, more fresh mineralogy like basalt. But putting this all together, this is a figure that uh, my colleague Elizabeth Engeldrum made. Uh, she works at Lock Lockheed Martin uh, here in Colorado. Uh, but basically, everything in red, those are resources that we have available on Mars. Um, ultimately combination between nuclear and solar power for our energy source, various types of uh, ISRU processing, so atmosphere, soil, um, 3D printing, all being used by a human colonist. And there has to be some sort of recycling of materials. And this figure kind of just puts everything together, but in, uh, it's, uh, I am running slightly long time. I want to get to everyone's questions. <laughs> so in conclusion, ISRU is really required for any sort of sustainable presence at any scale on Mars. Turns out that nearly all res necessary resources are available to enable a human presence and ultimately propellant production on Mars, manufacturing on Mars drastically reduces launch costs and ultimately reliance on Earth. So same thing goes for propellant production in, in the lunar orbit, in the cislunar space. Um, orbital refueling, all that's going to really drastically reduce launch costs. So substantial work is still needed in the areas of integrated systems development. So that's integrating all these technologies together, um, proving that these technologies will work. NASA's uh, technology readiness level scale is really important for this. And there needs to be a lot of work done uh, for growing food and uh, pr providing that that's actually possible. Uh, in terms of economics, SpaceX is aiming for a delivery cost of less than 100,000 uh, US dollars per pound of Mars. And that's from Elon Musk's 2017 paper. And they're always important to consider the ethics and legal considerations of this. So I draw it to your attention, the Outer Space Treaty, which says that space exploration is for the benefit of all of mankind. Uh, so I'd like to end with a quote uh, from Carl Sagan. If we survive, our time will be famous for two reasons that at this dangerous moment of technological adolescence, we managed to avoid self-destruction. And because this is the epoch in which we began our journey to the stars. And thanks everybody for your attention. And I'm gonna answer all your questions now. Could we use nuclear energy to compensate the lack of sunlight? Yes. Uh, ideally it would be like a combination of the two to answer your question, Victor. And you need a lot of battery storage. Uh, a lack of sunlight is also potentially caused by dust on solar arrays. And so that's a big problem as well. Just to give everyone a heads up, the next sessions will be starting in just a minute here, but Cole, feel free to hang out and continue answering yeah. questions if you yeah, like. Of course. Have we considered flow, using flow batteries, particularly organic aqueous flow batteries, which might be easier to make with ISRU? Yeah, that's a really good idea. Different types of batteries are definitely important. I just was kind of talking about lithium ion as a, because it's a technology that already already exists and has been shown to work on large scale battery banks. Yes, and generally speaking, do you feel perchlorates will be a major issue or will the remediation be pretty straightforward? Uh, per perchlorates are definitely a big issue. Uh, they showed in some Martian regular stimulants, the addition of a small amount of perchlorate mm -hmm. rendered the soil useless uh, for the plants to grow in. Um, but I think the remediation process mm -hmm. is actually straightforward. Um, I don't understand the full geochemistry of it, but it does definitely involve um, taking the taking those salts out by like changing the pH. 
will Martian glass be a significant product? Uh, probably not. It's likely that it's going to be needed at some scale. And you can imagine you need glass for like thick glass for windows. Um, when you need glass for producing like beakers for chemistry, for example, uh, it's probably not that significant of a product. Metals are way more important. Has any estimate high low range been made for the volume of regolith that needs to be mined? Yes, you can totally contact me for those kind of estimates. I can show you like how you would go about doing that. Um, and for different purposes, it would be different amounts of mass. So if you wanted a certain amount of water, you'd have to assume the weight percent of water in the soil. And then, um, then you could calculate the volume of regolith and the mass of regolith. Um, are there any numbers of availability of phosphates in the Martian regolith? Um, yes, just from data from the Curiosity rovers. Uh, it also varies at each site. Uh, you really, it's difficult to get a solid answer for this. Um, percent, it, it just, it completely varies across the surface in different locations. Um, the efficiency of the Sabatier process, the scaling of that, um, yeah, presume it, it does take a lot of temperature. It's both endothermic and exothermic. But I think, I think that the efficiency of it might actually improve on a larger scale. Uh, it depends on the technology as well. Like that's why a lot of the technological development still still has to still has to come through. Um, yeah, Jeffrey Landis here talks about the advantage of lithium ion batteries for sure. Well, yeah, I got Anthony Muscatello here. <laughs> I've, I've referenced a lot of a lot of these guys' papers. <laughs> yeah, fuel cells potentially, but the the time frame, like to answer your question, Tommy, the time frame for fuel cells isn't isn't the best. Um, it's it's less. It's like uh, on the order of days instead of instead of years. Yeah, thanks. Thanks everybody for your support. This is this has been awesome. I, I'd love to answer any more questions. If if I missed your question in the chat window, please repost it. So I yeah, Tam uh Tamishan Lathro Lathro. I just posted my mind's email in the chat window. You're welcome to email me questions. All right. Well, if that's all the uh, questions we have in the chat now, then I think we can probably wrap it up here. Um, Cole, on behalf of the Mars Society, thank you so much for your time and giving a fantastic presentation. And I want to wish you the uh, best of luck in your future endeavors. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Well, yeah, I can't believe. Yeah, th thank you, Jerry Stone. Thanks for that. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. I, I feel like I didn't. I feel like I did a decent job, but there's still so much that I could tell everybody. <laughs> And there's so much work that's being done. Uh, I encourage you to look online, try dive deeper into stuff, West websites specifically like Science Direct. There's way more stuff that you, that you that you don't know about that does exist that even like I don't know about that I keep finding every day that exists on this on this stuff. And we need everyone's help. So thanks everybody for joining. <clears throat> All right. Thanks again, Cole.